It's time to gear up for an immersive journey into the clandestine realm of Detroit's underworld, where the mesmerizing tale of mafioso Tony Deanna unfolds, a man whose tragic beginnings would shape his extraordinary destiny. Through his keen business acumen, strategic real estate investments, and bold dealings with the Ford Motor Company, Tony amassed untold millions for himself and the Zerilli Toko family. Yet Tony's story runs far deeper than what appears on the surface. Spearheading highly successful war bond drives during World War II and positively impacting his community in other ways, Tony Deanna's remarkable story defies the image of the stereotypical gangster. Button Guys would like to thank Mobster Chronicles for their help in putting this story together. You can find them on YouTube via the link in the description of this video. And be sure to visit the Button Guys of the New York Mafia website at www.thenewyorkmafia.com. Anthony Tony Deanna, also known as Tony Dana, Tony Cars, Tony D, and Anthony John Deanna, which was his true name was the eldest child born to Pasquale and Caterina Nijanola Diana on December 10, 1899, in San Vito Lo Capo, Sicily. In 1907, he immigrated to the United States with his parents and two younger siblings, arriving on Ellis Island via the passenger ship S.S. Duca Degli Abruzzi. Shortly thereafter, the family migrated to Wyandotte, Michigan, just south of Detroit. By that time, many of their fellow Amici from Italy had also migrated to the Detroit area. Tony's parents eventually had four other children together, but tragedy struck when his mother died of sepsis on January 2, 1915, after suffering a late-term miscarriage. The Deanna's infant son, who was named Joseph, died only three days later. Tony was just 15 at the time. In 1919, tragedy struck the Deanna family once again. On January 3rd, his uncle Antonio Tony Ginola was shot and killed as he was approaching his house. Newspapers reported he had been shot five times in the back by gunmen hiding in a dark alley behind his house. On February 3rd, Tony's own father, Pasquale, was killed as he was walking down a street with his brother-in-law, Salvatore Sam Ginola, who was apparently the intended target. Sam escaped the attempted assassination unharmed. It was later revealed that a rival mafia faction leader and former ally turned enemy of the Ginola clan by the name of John Vitale was behind the murder. Interestingly enough, Barguccia, who later became infamous as the man who warned the attendees of the ill-fated 1957 Appalachian Mafia meeting in upstate New York of the impending police raid, is the gunman believed to have fired the shots to kill Tony's father, mistaking Pasquale Deanna for Sam Ginola. Although it has been alleged that Pasquale was involved in the rackets with his Ginola in-laws, there is no clear proof this is the case. However, Sam and Tony Ginola were well-known mafiosi in Detroit's underworld. On October 2, 1919, Sam Ginola finally met his fate at the hands of rival gunmen who accosted him as he was stepping out of the front door of a local bank. Three assassins fired 28 bullets into Sam's body before escaping in a waiting getaway car. Tony Deanna, who at a mere 18 years old had suddenly become guardian and sole provider for his five younger siblings, dropped out of school, quickly packed up his family, and left the Detroit area for the safer confines of Springfield, Ohio, nearly 200 miles away from the bloody war happening in Detroit. Accompanying Tony and his young siblings were his uncle Tony Ginola's sister Grace, her husband Joe Baracco, Joe's parents, as well as his uncle Sam's widow Rose and four other young Ginola cousins. They all lived together in Springfield where Tony, as head of the household, found a job as an electrician to support his extended family. In August 1920, as John Vitale and his 17-year-old son Joe stepped off the front porch of their home and headed towards their car, they were met with a spray of bullets from a house across the street. Joe was killed instantly while John was wounded. The killers escaped in a taxi cab. 
But just a month later, John Vitale himself finally met his maker when unknown assailants struck him down with a barrage of bullets in the wee hours of the morning of September 28th. It is believed that the killings were an apparent retaliation for the murders of the Ginola brothers and Pasquale Deanna the previous year. And it has long been surmised that Tony Deanna was the one who had killed the Vitales. But considering Tony was only 20 years old at the time, living in another state 200 miles away and busy working to support his family, it seems highly unlikely that he was the man with the gun. Eventually, the Deanna family returned to Wyandotte. By that time, Tony had met a local Italian girl by the name of Frances Marie Baracco, whom he married in 1921. At the young age of 21, Frances had become not only a wife, but also a mom to Tony's younger brothers and sisters. In 1922, the Deannas further expanded their family with their first child together, a daughter they named Catherine after Tony's mother. In 1929, they had another daughter they named Letty after Frances's mother, Letizia. Catherine later married Anthony Bagnasco, a sergeant in the U.S. Army and son of Frank the Undertaker Bagnasco, a Detroit Mafia soldier killed in 1937. Anthony's brother Sam, by the way, who the authorities suspected was a Detroit Mafia soldier, married Rosalie Toko, the daughter of Detroit underboss William Vito Toko, better known as Black Bill. On May 12, 1927, Tony Deanna was naturalized in Detroit as a U.S. citizen. By 1930, the Deannas had moved in with his sister Grace and her husband Joe Baracco. By 1940, Tony had purchased his own home for his wife and children in Wyandotte. And by 1950, as he rose up the family ranks, he moved his family into a new home in ritzy Gross Point Park, one of five affluent communities that make up what is called Gross Point. It is also the area where most members of the Detroit family lived. Dozens of Detroit mafiosi, including some of the top guys called Gross Point Park Home, where they counted among their neighbors some of the early pioneers of the Detroit auto industry, such as the Fords. Tony Deanna's police record started in 1921 when he was 22 years old. Over the years, he was picked up on charges ranging from attempted bribery of an eyewitness to a murder to testify falsely in court, to alcohol bootlegging, conspiracy to violate the federal prohibition law, and armed robbery. In fact, Tony Deanna had actually gotten his start in the rackets under the early tutelage of his uncles. By the 1920s, he had graduated to liquor bootlegging and was alleged to have gone partners in bootlegging with the notorious Joe Massey, with whom he had gone to school and grown up with. Tony was a sugar merchant who sold sugar for the illegal production of distilled spirits to various bootleggers and rum runners during Prohibition. As an interesting side note, Joe Massey was probably the only made guy in the Detroit family who was only half Italian, as his mother was Irish. Other top mafiosi Deanna was on an intimate basis with included such iconic Detroit bigwigs as Angelo Melli, Matthew Mike the Enforcer Rubino, Pete and Yanni Licavoli, Joseph Scarface Joe Bamarito, Santo Perone, and the two top bosses of the Detroit family, Joseph Josie Zarilli, and his partner, William Black Bill Toko. By the 1940s, Tony Deanna was said to have become a millionaire several times over already, but his next move would elevate him to near star status within the overall Zerilli Bergata and in the eyes of both Zerilli and Toko. He was suspected to have formed a partnership of sorts with Harry Bennett, who was Henry Ford's troubleshooter and head of the Ford plant's internal security department. Bennett was well known for his union-busting efforts at the plant. Back in 1938, Tony was suspected of being behind the hit on Joe the Beer Baron Toko, no relation to Detroit underboss Black Bill Toko. Supposedly, there was a beef between Toko and Deanna over the very lucrative food concession business at Ford's various manufacturing facilities. It's alleged that Bennett awarded the contract to the Zerilli family in gratitude for them quelling union trouble, but probably also as insurance so that they wouldn't try to muscle in on any other Ford Motor Company business. In other words, Bennett wanted to keep the Zerilli family quiet. But why Toko was killed is unclear, 
And why Tony Deanna would be a suspect in that murder is even more unclear, as no real evidence has been uncovered to answer either of those questions. Nonetheless, through Deanna's manipulation of several labor unions connected to the United Auto Workers of America, as well as strong-arm tactics and his sheer force of character, he successfully infiltrated several major Detroit automobile manufacturers. Through the subsequent influence he gained over these national automotive companies, Tony Deanna soon applied a mafia-style stranglehold on them. He capitulated the companies into signing ongoing, years-long contracts to have his transport companies delivered to dealerships across the country on newly manufactured Ford cars. By that time, Tony had quickly formed the ENL Transport Company in Dearborn, Michigan, which was the world headquarters for Ford Motor Company. He also formed another ENL Transport Company in Indiana. Both handled the steady and heavy workload coming off Ford's assembly lines. In addition, Deanna was a partner in the Pardo Ford dealership in Wyandotte and later Wyandotte Motors, another Ford dealership. In 1957, ENL Transport delivered 72 new Fords on 15 carrier trucks to Carson's dealership in St. Joseph, Michigan. It was the largest single shipment of Fords ever made to a dealership in southwestern Michigan at the time. It was so large, it needed a police escort and was a near record breaker for Tony's E&L firm. And it was these business successes that earned Tony his nickname, Tony Cars. Over the next several decades, Tony and the Zerilli family realized huge annual incomes from these investments. And coupled with other investments he reportedly made into various properties and buildings throughout the years, and the annual rental income he realized from his reportedly significant real estate portfolio, Tony Deanna was said to have been one of the wealthier mafiosi of that particular borgata. But aside from his alleged organized crime activities, Tony also spent a significant portion of his time volunteering and supporting the Italian-American community in the Detroit area. During World War II, as chairman of the Detroit chapter of the Italian Labor Victory Council, among other groups he was a member of, Deanna organized fundraising drives to help needy children in Italy who had been adversely affected by the fighting. In 1941, he arranged to have Breckenridge Long, a U.S. ambassador to Italy, speak at a dinner highlighting Italian-American support of the war. Tony told the press, our people are good and patriotic citizens, and we want everyone to know it. Unfortunately, the situation overseas leads to wrong implications. I am confident that after Sunday's meeting, no one will think for a minute that we are anything but 100% loyal to America. We all love this country, which has been good to us. Later, Deanna further showed his American patriotism by heading up several drives to promote and sell war bonds to support U.S. efforts in the war. In 1943, he launched a campaign to sell war bonds through Ford dealerships, one of the first such campaigns in the country at the time. The goal was $5 million. Tony Deanna raised $16 million, equivalent to $281 million in 2023. Because of this significant contribution, the U.S. Navy named one of its warships the USS Goslin in his honor in recognition of this effort. And in turn, Deanna dedicated the ship to Joseph Polizzi, who was the first Italian-American from Detroit killed in World War II. The USS Goslin, by the way, was one of the first U.S. ships to hit the beach in Tokyo Bay in Japan during the American occupation of that country and the money Deanna helped raise, which originally would have been for a small mercy ship, was so significant that the U.S. Navy opted for the large destroyer escort instead. In 1945, after the war was over, Deanna arranged for another warship to visit Detroit where the residents could board and see what the Navy was all about. And he did this to help kick off another war bond drive, this time to benefit wounded veterans and their families. In 1951, Deanna's business relationship with Ford came under scrutiny during the infamous Kefauver hearings into organized crime's role in interstate commerce, which were being held in 14 major cities across the U.S., including Detroit. Deanna was intensely interrogated by senators, 
who questioned him on the semantics of whether the word mafia was a noun or an adjective, as well as the murder of his uncles and father and his business dealings with the Ford Company. And he was vilified by the press, who only a few years earlier showered him with praise. In later years, Tony became a longtime supporter and benefactor of the Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit, where his wife had been a longtime patient before losing her life to bone cancer in 1979. After her death, the Deanna family established a memorial fund in her honor for the study and research of bone cancer and metabolic bone disease. Throughout his life, he was also very involved in the Holy Family Church in Detroit, where he was a patron and benefactor along with some other Detroit Mafia bigwigs like Joe Zerilli, who served as parish council president, and Bill Tocco. In fact, the three men were in charge of the church's annual Italian feast, which was its major annual fundraising effort. In alternating years, Tony, Bill, and Joe would each donate a luxury car to be raffled off, since they all owned car dealerships. Tony, of course, was a Ford man, and Zerilli and Toko represented General Motors. Sometime in the 1950s, during a trip to Italy, Tony and his wife Frances purchased a holy statue and donated to the church, which in turn used it for the festival and parade honoring the Madonna del Grazie. Holy Family still uses the statue today. And even after everyone moved far away to the eastern suburbs of Detroit, they all still remain loyal benefactors and supporters of their hometown church. Anthony Tony Carr's Deanna died of natural causes five years after his beloved wife Frances on May 27, 1984 in Gross Point, Michigan. He was 84 years old. We hope you enjoyed this story on Detroit Mafia star Tony Deanna. Be sure to check out the Button Guys website at www.thenewyorkmafia.com for more mobster profiles and mafia history. Thank you for watching. Until next time.